we will get to Doug in a few minutes. This, I only have one slide, this is it. But as they say in, on television, a word from our sponsor and those folks that you see on the, or the organization you see on the slide are the people that have helped put this together. So I first met Doug back in 2011 when I had him come here to Wilmington to give a presentation. We had him back a couple of times after that and he stayed with me and I got just a very brief quickie story. That was really a treat to have him stay with me, especially getting up at 2 a.m. in the morning, going down where he had set up a sheet with a light on it to attract the moths and to see all the moths that were attracted to that sheet. I was amazed at all the moths. I was just going bananas. And Doug was saying, oh, ho-hum, there's no new ones there. <laughs> So yeah, I, I assume you remember that, Doug. But anyway, <laughs> I am giving the introduction to Doug as though you don't know him, but I can't imagine anybody in the audience not already knowing Doug. It's like you say, uh, he needs no introduction. So here we go. Doug, it's yours. <laughs> OK, thank you, Charlie. You have to stop screen sharing so I can screen share. OK. All right. Okay, are we up? I'm assuming we're up. I can't hear anybody. You're good. Yes, to go. looking good. Okay, looking good. Up. All right. <clears throat> now I know this was advertised as bringing nature home, and that, of course, is what I've been talking about for just about 20 years now. Um, but if you do bring nature home, you are nature's best hope. So that's what that title is all about. I do want to tell you about my idea of nature's best hope. But before I do that, I want to talk to you what, about what E.O. Wilson's idea of bringing nature home was. <clears throat> uh, Edward O. Wilson, of course, uh, was a professor at Harvard for, I don't know, 50 some years. He died the day after Christmas this year. So it was a terrible loss to the world of conservation world of sociobiology, lots of worlds. Um, he was uh, one of the most productive scientists of our time, for sure. But one of the things that was consistent about his, his uh, career was his efforts to save life on Earth. He loved biodiversity. He knew that we needed it, that it wasn't optional. And in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. Uh, and he had one simple message that if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature, we have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of planet Earth, or we're going to lose it everywhere. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we could actually do that. And of course, to conservation biologists, um, this, is, this is, just sounds great. We'll just put half the planet aside and everything will be happy. The problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we've got just about 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our houses and airports and, and roadways and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So how could this actually happen? Well, that's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, I do think we can realize EO's dream, but we're going to need a new approach to conservation to do that. But before we talk about that, let's talk about what happened on the East Coast in 2019. We had what we call an oak mast, where members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. And I got to watch the whole thing. First, it chewed a hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there and it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, finally plopped down. Uh, very dangerous time for this insect larva because there are a lot of things that wanna eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And then within that chamber converts itself to a pupa and then surprisingly stays as a pupa in that chamber underground for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. 
lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it. Uh, and that is how the larva gets into the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the, the following year the way most insects would? And the answer is that it takes red oak acorns uh, 18 months to complete their development. So if the weevils came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. After they leave the acorn though, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. You know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move, time to grab the larvae, grab the eggs. They move the entire colony into the new acorn. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes. But once they're in there, they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point with this little story? That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of acorns. They'll take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree, and then they tap it below the surface of the soil. And the object is you're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. Well, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen, the only plant that that bee can rear its young on. Uh, turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them are uh, specialists on particular types of pollen. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could talk about nature specialized relationships uh, the rest of the night, the rest of the week, the rest of the year. The point I want to make tonight, though, is that um, these relationships, nature itself, is on the ropes today. And it's on the ropes today because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. Uh, and those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We have 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need them to sustain, because that's the nature that's keeping us alive on this planet. So you might wonder why we've done that. I wonder why we've done that, and, and I don't know. But I suspect that we thought planet Earth, our nest, was so, so large that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. And the UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years, and they actually said that two years ago, so maybe it's the next 18 years. Uh, makes a, a nice headline, but um, it is not an option, folks. We have to make sure this does not happen. These are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment that's upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take uh, small efforts from, from lots of people, 
people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change uh, energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and those animals would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that, that uh, rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here though, and, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that healthy ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on, like the production of oxygen, like clean water, they're cleaning our water and slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Plants are, are capturing carbon. They're grabbing the carbon dioxide out of the air, pulling it out of harm's way, building their tissues out of the carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that, that plant roots have put there over the eons. Plants are building topsoil and holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. That'll be hard. Maybe we could all lose weight finally. What do animals do for plants? Uh, they provide pest control services, very important. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before because we've got so many people on the planet. Now we do have parks and we do have preserves and they're doing the best we, they can, but we are in the sixth great extinction this planet has ever witnessed. So obviously it's not good enough, which means in the future, we have to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on properties just like this. There have been uh, visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups who have been good at doing that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo uh, had a lot of faith in humans. He believed that we were smart enough to develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could do them gently enough. We could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about was de developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, what I wanna argue this evening is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Now we have to turn that on its head and we have to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we do that? 
Uh, well, we can't ignore private property because most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. When I use the word conservation, I'm, I'm not really using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bit of nature that is, is left out there uh, for sure. And that's what we've been doing for the last 100 years. Uh, but we now need to put back together all the parts that we have destroyed, or as much as possible. Um, and, and in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks, the species that contribute the most to ecosystem function. And the two groups that we can't do without, uh, and that would be the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They, of course, are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it through photosynthesis into the food that keeps all the animals on the planet alive. Now they store that energy in their parts, mostly in their leaves, but most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something is typically insects and not just any insects. Turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, uh, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, that is the one of the birds that's at our feeder all winter long eating seeds, and we tend to think that that's what chickadees need, seeds. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds, but the other 50% is insects and spiders. And when they go to reproduce in the springtime, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch entirely to insects. Uh, and if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, this is a citizen science project that one of my uh, uh, graduate students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call for bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season. Some of you might have participated in this. And the object was to get pictures of birds as they were carrying prey items, carrying food to the nest to feed their babies. People are going to send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify what those prey items were and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as she possibly could. And it was very successful. She got thousands of pictures. Uh, and you're looking at a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families in North America, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we designed landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them? Most of our birds would not be able to successfully reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? Well, there's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. A thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's, it's made of chitin, which is undigestible. And the birds don't want a lot of chitin. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. If you ever watch a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids to get, get one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, and many beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic, organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our, our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from during the breeding season? from the prey items that, they, that they're eating. But look, carotenoid content is not equal. It's not equally distributed across bird prey. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Uh, here are the adult caterpillars here, the, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. Only the caterpillars eat the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. 
So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are really important to birds. They are not optional parts of the diet of most of the species. So let's just say birds need a lot of caterpillars. The next question is, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. So let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? Well, one or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to rear one clutch of chickadees, to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, after they fledge, uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of, of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they're only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not provide all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like that's directly related to the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years and divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like doves and finches can actually reproduce on a milk they make out of seeds, and they don't need insects. And look, the, the birds that did not, do not require insects didn't decline at all in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to expand our goals uh, for, for landscaping. You know, we've got 135 million acres of residential landscapes in this country. And right now they're landscaped with one purpose in mind and that is to make them pretty. So we wanna expand that. We want them to be, now be pretty and ecologically functional. And that's not gonna happen unless we put caterpillars in those landscapes. So how do you add caterpillars to, to residential landscapes? You do that by adding the plants that, that support those caterpillars. Seems pretty easy, uh, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which plants we're gonna put in our yard. And we have to be fussy because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. This is a monarch butterfly. And of course you can have all the uh, crepe myrtle and all the camellias and all the ginkgos and all the burning bush and all the things that we typically landscape with, all those plants from Asia, and you won't support a single monarch butterfly. The only hand that's gonna support a monarch butterfly is one of the, the milkweed species that they depend on. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why is that? Well, that's, that's the way plants have made them. Uh, plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me after this talk, go out and eat a plant, see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. It's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat, eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat particular plant lineages for which they have developed very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses, to neutralize them. They develop Enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of, of evolutionary history with those plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you, if you take all the milkweeds out of your yard and put in hostas, the monarch butterfly is not gonna be able to start to, to develop on hostas. It has two choices. It's got to fly away and find milkweed someplace else, or it's going to starve to death. Turns out there are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that do not contribute energy 
to local food webs. And they're plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. A real good example of a contributor would be one of the oaks. They're contributing more energy across the country than any other type of plant. Uh, ginkgos, good example of a non-contributor. Um, they're, they're sitting in your yard, but nothing can eat them. So they're really not contributing any energy. And a good example of a plant that's detracting energy from the food web would be an invasive species like calorie pear. Uh, that after you plant it, jumps out of your yard and, and fills up all of our natural areas. Um, moving out, pushing out the plants that do support food webs and replacing it with a plant that does not. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to rebuild the food webs that support our local ecosystems, we've got to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. And I'm going to start with, with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is where uh, my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000. Uh, it was part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. And the last thing they did in the farm was mow it for hay. So there were very few plants there when we moved in. And our, our uh, goal was to restore ecosystem function here. But I have to admit, in the year 2000, I didn't know a whole lot about that. I did know that I like caterpillars, and I wanted to see if I could get some of them to make a living at my house. Uh, so I started with the Canadian outlet. Now, I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet, but that's what one looks like. It's a pretty little thing. Uh, that's what the adult looks like. Um, and people say, why'd you, check, why'd you pick the ca Canadian outlet? Well, I, I thumbed my way through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America, and I said, that's a pretty one. So we started with that one. In order to have Canadian outlets, you have to have meadow root. It's a specialist on meadow root, just like monarchs are a specialist on milkweeds. And we didn't have any meadow root. Uh, there was meadow root here, I'm sure, a long time ago, but our, our land was farmed almost 300 years, so it was long gone. Uh, so I got some meadow root seeds from someplace else and I planted them and they grew very nicely. But this was early on and I actually had very little faith that, that uh, Canadian outlets would be able to find my patch of meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check it for at least two months after I planted. Then uh, I was walking by uh, one day for another reason and I looked over and it was covered. My meadow root was covered with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that, but now we've got a good population of metaru and good population of Canadian outlets. So we've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. I think you guys in the South call it ditch daisy. Well, we didn't have any ditch daisy, but um, I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a Power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds and I planted them at home and they did very nicely, very nicely. That's, that's now my front yard. They took over this year, but uh, I'm not complaining. But it took a year for the, uh, the Goldenrod Stowaway to find my, my Bidens. Uh, they finally did though. And now we have a good population of both of those. So now we have four, we've added four species to the property. Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. Um, I wanted the Hackberry Emperor in our, our property, not because it's the prettiest butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that should be here. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry. So I got a couple of Hackberry trees and I planted them. Had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my, my Hackberry, but they did. And now we've got a good population of those as well. So now we've added six species. And that's how the restoration went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come yet, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found my goldenrod yet, but it hasn't. That's what its caterpillars look like. But it's still part of the fun. This is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check my, my goldenrod right about now, uh, looking for these caterpillars. One of these years I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great year. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know some people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's got good fall color. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. They're very high in fat and that's what migrating birds need. It's a good ground cover. It's a, it's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. 
Its flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. You don't even know it's in bloom until you see this cloud of native bees around it. Remember, when you're planting a pollinator garden, you're planting for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best uh, host plant for the big sphinx moths that uh, cardinals love to feed their young. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult. The lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course we lost American elms to the Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are a couple of big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make seeds. Uh, so after we moved in, I got a few of those seeds and planted them at home. They germinate in six days, excuse me. Uh, and they grew very nicely. Now those trees are 80 feet tall and they brought in the double tooth prominent, another big success, American elm. Want to see if I get the evening primrose moth at our house because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we had no evening primrose. So I planted that, Enothera. And the moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it gets crowded in there. They're all very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, those are just examples of the plants that, that, that we have put back on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Uh, it's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You will not live long enough. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns. Uh, or as, as, and that means they were free, by the way, or as two foot bare root whips that uh, only cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web by calling in the moths that produce the caterpillars that support most of the things that are out there. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the uh, pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars have come to the oaks on my property. And they come right away. This is a pin oak uh, that uh, has just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to support the wildlife around you. This is what our, our house looks like today. Actually, right there is where that, that Biden's patch is um, right now. But uh, it's just to show you we put the plants back, at least some of the plants back. Uh, and as soon as we did, life started to come to, to our bare patch of ground. Now, over the years, my research has shown that you can estimate the quality of your local food web just by counting the number of moth species that occur there because they're the backbone of that food web. So I started doing that five years ago, taking a picture of every species of moth that I have found on our property. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,189 species of moths so far and I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Now we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we've got 44% of all the, the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these, these moth caterpillars are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says we've lost two thirds of the wildlife since 1970. It's a, it's a frightening statistic, uh, but I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. Imagine what would happen if everybody put the plants back. We could turn this around. So please don't give up. 
But I know what you're thinking. Uh, Cindy and I have 10 acres. What happens if you have a smaller piece of property, maybe in suburbia? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They're in the middle of a development, surrounded by everybody with the big lawns. When they moved into their property, it was choked with, with Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, another invasive from, from Asia. So they got rid of that and they planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feeder feature, and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. You birders know that that's a good number of warbler species. We've only recorded eight warbler species at our house so far. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, that tower right back there is, is uh, one of the towers on O'Hare Airport. She is right next to the airport. She has one tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one tenth of an acre because Pam is a native plant uh, landscape designer. Um, but she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she sat back, as she says, with a glass of wine uh, and started to count the birds that are using her yard. And she's up to 124 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. It's right there. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're gonna succeed in a big way. And we do wanna succeed in a big way. And one of them is to address this big lawn issue. We've got, right now it's around 44 million acres of lawn in the US. That's a, a, an area bigger than New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, you know, lawn is a status symbol. And we also have to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took areas like this and turn them into this? Now this is, I got this picture from Dan Getman. I've never met Dan Getman, but he sent it to me. He said, look, I had this big lawn and I'm, I'm doing it. I'm planting these, all these native plants. This is only the second year of the planting. So he's, he's coming right along there. Well, that would give us 20 million acres. We'll make the math simple. We've got 40 million acres to cut that in half. We could put 20 million acres towards conservation right at home and create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Adapolis Park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put a park at home? What do you get when you put some part of nature right where you live? You get the opportunity to interact with that, to, to have a personal relationship with that part of mother nature. And you can do it at your own pace. All you have to do is go outside or all you have to do is look out your window. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, uh, that's uh, what 375 million people went to national parks last year. So uh, you're gonna see a lot of other people. Uh, it's also free if you do it at home. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what uh, pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential to building that personal relationship with the natural world so that you care about it. And it's particularly important for our, our poor kids. Our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour to a natural place, they walk around for an hour, and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and become friends with it, get to know it, learn something about it alone, no parental supervision. Let them work it out by themselves. It'll be much more meaningful that way. They will come home again, I guarantee it. You know, when we hover over our kids, we're sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. Uh, and that is not the message we wanna send about nature. 
And it's particularly important to uh, teach our kids how to be stewards of the planet. They're the future. If they're afraid of nature, if they don't know what stewardship is all about, if they don't love what they're stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a little piece of lawn with a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this slide to, to tell me how to catch lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of that lizard. You fall in love with that part of the natural world. And then you want to protect it. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be, be crawling on the ground uh, in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. Uh, but I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards uh, in Hawaii the rest of her life. Uh, and, and I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of that experience. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. Go to homegrownnationalpark.org, our website, and register your property and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you're going to cut the area of lawn uh, in half or, or cut it down by one foot. I don't care. Whatever you do, put it on the mat. Maybe you're protecting uh, some trees, a woodlot in your, your back. You can put that on there. Maybe you're only going to put an aster in a flower pot and put it on your porch. Good enough. Um, then put that area on, on in, the, in the map and your little piece of your county is going to light up. It's free, by the way. But the object here is, is to get the whole country to, to light up. We want the message that, that everybody is an important component of the future of conservation to go viral. This is our attempt at social media to get people to spread the message, get believers to spread the message to uh, the vast majority of the public that, that doesn't have a clue that they are the future of conservation. Um, about 10,000 people on the map so far. And if I didn't mention it, it's free. So please join Homegrown National Park and tell your neighbors too as well. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was once lawn? Um, I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. Uh, and if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants, the keystone plants, are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants as the two by fours that are holding up the ecological house that you're building in your yard. Uh, they're the support system. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. You're not through building your house uh, when you've got your two by fours there, but um, it's an essential, essential start. So the question is no longer simply are native plants better than non-native plants. On average, they certainly are, but um, there's a lot of native plants that aren't doing all that much either. So the question really is, do we want to favor the ones that are doing the most, those contributors? Do we want to favor the, the plants uh, that, are, that are helping the pollinators the most and the caterpillars the most? or not. What is helping the caterpillars the most? It's one of our oak trees. They are the best keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant that comes close to doing uh, that much for our local food webs. How do you find out what the best keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder, on the National Wildlife Federation website, and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the woody and herbaceous plants that occur in your county uh, will pop up. Now, this is an abbreviated list because I ran out of room. And I will mention that, that uh, Audubon has a very similar uh, website, uh, Plants for the Birds, I think it's called. I want to focus on these for a while. Uh, the herbaceous plants that are top ranked. Goldenrods are always way up there. Native asters are way up there. Perennial sunflowers are way up there. And not only do they produce the most caterpillars, but they also produce, uh, they're the best plants for the specialist 
these that we talked about earlier. Um, if you have goldenrods, asters, and, and perennial sunflowers in your yard, there are at least 44 species of bees that can make a living in your yard that won't be able to make a living if you don't have those plants. So remember, when you're planting a pollinator garden, focus on those, those plants that are good for specialist bees because the generalist bees can use them as well. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants and attract a lot of insects to our yard. And then we're gonna kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. There's a lot of uh, research these days that are, is showing very convincingly that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, particularly really hammering those, those uh, moths uh, that are creating the caterpillars that are running the food web. This is all the ways that that happens, but it's actually good news to me uh, because we've got to turn around insect declines, not just stop it. We've got to turn it around. We've got to have insect population increases. And if we can do that by flicking a switch, just, just turning out those lights, uh, we're getting off easy. That's very easy to do. Now, there's a lot of switches to flick, but but we're good switch flickers. But I know what you're going to say. Oh, gee, I can't turn the light out over my front porch or over my garage or over my barn because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is the bad man doesn't come very often. And even easier is take the white bulb out of those security lights and put in a yellow bulb, a uh, yellow LED. Is, is the best because it's energy efficient. Nocturnal insects are far less attracted to yellow wavelengths than they are to white or blue wavelengths. If we put took out our white bulbs and put in a yellow bulb overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, millions of dollars as well. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights or put in a yellow bulb. And then we're going to invite a mosquito fogger to come kill of all, all of our insects booming business around the country. Um, nobody likes mosquitoes. So we hire these foggers and they, they say, you know, it's okay because this is a, they're fogging a natural product, pyrethroids. And it is a natural product. It's industrial strength pyrethroids. That's the compound that is found in chrysanthemums. And by the way, it's in chrysanthemums because it kills insects that eat chrysanthemums. Uh, but they say it's a natural product, so it's okay. But you know what? Cyanide is a natural product too. So I don't think that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And boy, I wish they were right. But in fact, it kills all the insects that it comes in contact with, including monarchs. Big monarch kills a couple of years ago and they flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on, on the ground. Uh, the ironic thing is it doesn't control mosquito populations. In order to control mosquitoes, you've got to kill 90% of the adults. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you've got to kill 90%. And, and these foggers only kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not even close to being effective, which is why they have to keep coming back and back and, and doing it over and over again and charging you each time. If you really want to kill mosquitoes, you control them in the larval stage. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of organic matter like, like a straw or hay or, or some dead leaves, maybe some dead grass, uh, and let it ferment for a couple of days. It's, what you're doing is building up the population of diatoms and algae in your bucket. And that becomes an irresistible brew to adult female mosquitoes who want to lay their eggs. That is what mosquito larvae eat. So they'll lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks. It's just biological control. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, a formulation that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. If a dragonfly gets in there, not gonna hurt it a bit. If, if your dog drinks it, it's not gonna hurt it. Um, completely non-toxic to anything except aquatic uh, diptera. You might put a coarse screen over it so the chipmunk doesn't jump in and, and drown. But this is targeted. It's cheap. I think it costs $9 or something. Um, and you will control a lot of mosquitoes, particularly if everybody does it. But, you know, if you're going to have a party in your backyard, you're worried about the mosquitoes, get a fan. It creates a directed stream. The mosquitoes can't fly into it. And it's the cheapest, fastest, easiest way to control those mosquitoes when you're outdoors. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is landscape in a way that allows those all important caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is just an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where 
oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the, the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, uh, and, and then it does it all over again. And everything happens on the tree. Well, I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as caterpillars on the tree, but then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way underneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact the soil under these trees so that it's too hard for those caterpillars to get underground, which means the way we landscape in so many places becomes an ecological trap. It calls in the moths, they lay their eggs, the caterpillars grow and then drop down and die. And if we're doing that everywhere, we're killing, killing uh, caterpillars everywhere. I'm convinced that the way we landscape is another really important cause of insect declines. And of course, the cement landscape is not the solution either. This is what most people do. You have a tree in a yard and you've got your grass. I've got a, a new grad student this year who's uh, going to study how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. Uh, but I guarantee they're gonna do better in a situation like this where you have a tree with a layered landscape, maybe a native dogwood here, uh, and then an azalea and, and ferns and ground cover. This creates a soft landing for those caterpillars that fall out of this tree. The ground is not compacted. Nobody's gonna walk on them. Nobody's gonna mow them. They can easily get underground and pupate, or they can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under here. Survivorship is predicted to be much higher. This is a great place to do your spring ephemeral gardening, creates a safe site for those caterpillars, and it also is a way to reduce the lawn. You put big beds around your trees, and all of a sudden you have less lawn to mow. And the tree will love it, by the way. Trees do not like grass right up to them. Use those uh, native uh, lands, uh, land, what do you call them, ground covers liberally. Things like uh, wild ginger or native pachysandra, or there's our Virginia creeper being a ground cover, golden seal, uh, uh, may apples, foam flower, ferns, all great ground covers. You know, this is the way the ground ought to look. You shouldn't be able to see mulch. You shouldn't be able to see the ground. We call this green mulch, and it creates those, those really effective um, safe, safe sites for those caterpillars. Another former grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some uh, wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. Uh, and uh, the, her results suggest that there is room for compromise in our plant choice, and that's good news. She had one simple question, how well the chickadee populations do in residential landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus residential landscapes that are dominated by non-natives, those typical introduced plants from Asia. And the first thing she found is when they're dominated by, by non-natives, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you've reduced the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Uh, now, the, there were nest boxes up in everybody's yard, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to breed. If they did try to breed, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they provide 1.2, produce 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all this into a population growth model, as a function of the, per the, the percentage of woody plant non-native biomass in your yard, from none to 100%, this is what you get. We focused on woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, which you do when you have very few, a well, very low percentage of, of woody non-natives, you have a growing population. But if you have fewer babies than adults dying, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. And that's what you get when you've got a high percentage of non-native plants. Right here is where those, those uh, lines intercept, liberally speaking. Um, so liberally speaking, you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. Now, none of these, we can't tolerate any invasive plants. So no calorie pear, no barberry, no, no burning bush. 
um, because those things are ecological tumors. They don't stay in your yard. Their, their propagules go out and they castrate the local ecosystem. But there are a lot of, of ornamental plants that are not invasive. Remember old Dan Getman here? That's a ginkgo tree. I don't know if you picked that up the first time. Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native plant planting? Uh, because his wife likes ginkgos and she asked him to put one in. So he did. Is it ruining the ecological effectiveness of this planting? No. Is it invasive? No. It's really just sitting there. So I like to think of these plants as if they're statues. So there you go. There's, there's our statue. The question is, how many statues do you want? Remember, it's, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those, those contributors, those native plants that are contributing most to our food webs. If we increase the percentage of them, we can tolerate uh, plants that are not contributing that much. Can we use native plants uh, in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that. And every single plant in that landscape is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in, in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're, they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. This formalizes it. This tells your neighbors it's not just a pile of weeds you forgot to mow. It's, you know, it's not very big, but it is servicing the needs of several species of, of bees. And, and it would be quite effective if everybody had a pollinator garden like this. Um, remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. I don't like that argument for two reasons. It's wrong. They pollinate about a twelfth of our crops. And people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget that argument. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? A Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Absolutely. And more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota's been doing it for a while now. They've got a cost sharing program. The state pays people to reduce or replace their lawns with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Florida, there's an island off Florida that's encouraging residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. Now, they're paying people to do that. This is the way the, the Endangered Species Act should have been written, in my, my opinion, with carrots rather than sticks. If you've got an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to be a good steward of that species rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on, on these invasive ornamentals like calorie pear. That's what uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas has done, um, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, South Carolina, I think, has banned them all together. North Carolina's got a bounty on them, if, um, if I recall. So you take out a, a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Water utilities are giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient native plants rather than the thirsty non natives. And of course, the big lawn reduction programs in the far west, particularly California, uh, this rebate's gone up to $3 now. You get $3 per square for every square foot of, of lawn that you take out and replace with xeric plantings. California does not have one drop of water to waste on lawn. And if you want more information about those programs, memorize that. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And this first one's important. We've started to think of nature as if it's optional, which means it's not essential, which means when, when resources are in short supply, when push comes to shove, nature takes a back seat. We're only gonna fund the things that are essential. And of course, that's all the time. Resources are always in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the, the uh, pandemic broke out and they have this wall-sized poster there that to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, we want to save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument with the, the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so that future generations can enjoy them. 
And I understand that nature is enormously entertaining, but it's more than entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations, a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we only, if we, if we restrict conservation efforts just to the places where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those places are too few and too small. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our, our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together. And again, folks, we've got to put the plants back, not just to connect viable habitats with biological carters, but to recreate viable habitat where we've destroyed it. We're starting to do this, it's starting to take effect. And once it does, once we finish, it'll be the first time in modern history that we have actually coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why. Because everybody in the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody share the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you are taught them. We are good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, one person can put a yellow bulb in their, their outdoor lights, one person can remove the invasive plants that are already on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can use keystone plants. There's lots of things one person can do to revitalize the ecosystem on their property, which then enhances their local ecosystem instead of degrades it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the planet that you can, you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks a lot. Wow, Doug, uh, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for showing up today. My name is Ben Graham. I'm with Audubon, North Carolina. And as promised, we're gonna do a little Q&A now. Um, uh, and to answer one of the most common questions in the chat right off the bat, this webinar is recorded. So if you didn't write down the name of every single caterpillar, don't worry, we'll send you a link uh, tomorrow to this whole presentation. Um, so with that, I think we should just dive right in. Um, we got a lot of good questions and a lot to get through. So we have, we have, we have a few questions about climate change. Um, and I might just start by asking broadly, um, well, I, I guess one of the specific questions is what role is climate change playing in the decline of insects and caterpillars? And then also just more broadly, how do you think about climate change um, with all of this? How does it play into your thinking? Well, climate change in many cases is very hard on our insects, uh, particularly the droughts. 
Um, if the drought kills the, the uh, plant that supports the insect, of course, the insect suffers too. And then you've got those fires that are associated with the droughts. Insects don't do well in fire fires, uh, those giant, giant fires. So that's very hard. Floods are very hard on insect. When you have floods that cover the land for, for days or weeks at a time, anything that's in the soil is going to drown. Um, so it's erratic weather that is, is hard on our, our insects. Um, so, you know, right now it's hard on the birds too, folks. Right now the, the drought in California is preventing the oaks from making acorns. What's the acorn woodpecker going to do this winter? These are serious, serious issues. Um, so it's having a big effect. But um, I do want to point out, though, it is not the only problem that we have. Uh, if we had no climate change at all, we would still have a biodiversity crisis. So um, it's not just about climate change. What do I think about, about climate change? I think one of the best ways that the average individual can actually have an impact is putting the plants back. Every plant you put back is gonna, gonna help pull carbon out of the atmosphere. A third of the carbon that's up there causing troubles has come from us cutting the plants down on this planet, removing mostly forests. We've removed more than half the planet's forest at this point. So we can put it back, we really can. Um, so you could start that tomorrow. Great answer, thank you. And so one, one specific question here that we got from a viewer um, is whether you have observed uh, that what is considered native is changing in areas because of climate change um, or if that's something that's projected to happen. You mean our plants moving around? Um, they are, not, not um, as fast as you might think, but particularly you see this in, in mountain ranges where plants from lower altitudes are now doing well at higher altitudes. This is a problem for alpine plants that are gonna get pushed up right to the point where there is no alpine uh, left. And then they're in a little island, they're, they're gonna be lost. Uh, but thing, plants like uh, the sugar maple is, is now doing poorly in its lower latitudes and only doing well in the higher latitudes. So we do see some changes that are, that are happening. And a lot of people think, well, maybe if we move the southern plants up north, uh, that will that will help. The problem is, it's not a gradual warming that we're seeing. It's increase in erratic weather. So uh, remember, just two years ago, we had a freeze that in in February, I think it was, that went all the way down to Mexico. It was so cold that it killed a lot of native plants, not just the non-natives that we've we've been moving north. So if you move a southern plant up, and we have more of this erratic weather, which we have every year. Um, those cold snaps are gonna, gonna kill it. What's gonna help with climate change is the most genetic variability possible in our, our plant populations so that they can, they can handle it, they can adapt to it. Uh, and that's another reason to minimize your use of cultivars because cultivars have zero genetic variability. They're all clones of each other. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. Great, thanks. So we, uh of course, got a ton of very specific plant and insect questions. So maybe we can go through a few of those. Um, a, a couple about oaks, um, which you talked a lot about. The first one here, do you need a large area for an oak tree? You know, how deep do the roots grow and what should someone be thinking about when they want to do an oak in their yard? Okay, good question. There are a lot of large oaks, but there's some small oaks as well. Uh, Quercus prinoides is the dwarf chestnut oak, makes acorns when it's five feet tall. The Georgia oak uh, is, is a dwarf oak as well. As you move further west, there are a number of species that are dwarf oaks. There are oaks in California that are ground covers. So not all oaks are giants. Oaks grow in all kinds of, of situations. The chestnut oak uh, does really well in shallow, uh, rocky soil. That's where you're going to find it. White oaks do well in a situation like that, too. Uh, but there's oaks that, that like their feet wet, like the, the pin oak or, or swamp white oak. Uh, so whatever soil type you have, there's an oak that, that likes it. We have 91 species of oaks in this country. So you can find one that, that works where you are. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I guess another oak question here, it's kind of broad, but do all oaks support a large variety of caterpillar species or is it just certain species of oaks? 
you know, that, that, re that question has not been researched really well. I had a student that compared 16 species of oaks. There were some differences, but not much. The white oak group did a little bit better than the red oak group, but not, not much. The oaks that didn't support as much as, as the leaders were the oaks that were planted out of their range. So where we live, willow oak, we're at the very northern uh, range of, of willow oak. And a lot of people plant them and they, they do well, but they're above the point where the, a lot of the insects that specialize in willow oaks are. Same thing with water oak. We're way, way up at the top there. Uh, so when you move oaks out of their native range, they're going to be less productive. But by and large, I would say all the oaks are great. So pick the oak that's going to do best in, in your uh, environment and your, your soil type, as opposed to trying to find the most productive one. Sounds like you can't go wrong with an oak. With a native oak. You know, when you go a to native the oak. Tree, they're going to try to sell you the English oak. They're going to try to sell you Quercus Sagittarius, which is Chinese oak. You know, with 91 species of native oaks, we just don't need the non-natives. So you, uh, you showed a lot of pictures of lawns. We got a few questions about what and, and of how people can do native plants gardens that work with lawns. But we got questions about what folks can do if they want to grow something instead of grass, um, you know, essentially native grasses, I would imagine. And one specific question was on top of a septic field, as an example. Mm -hmm. of the that's a great place to put a, a meadow. You, you really don't want trees on top of a septic field, um, but the the meadow meadow plants, their roots can go down there, but they're still they're not going to rip apart your your field. So that's a good place for for a, a meadow planting. Um, you know, I say reduce the area of lawn. I don't say get rid of it. So the place to use lawn would be for paths to move around your landscape or as a cue for care along your driveway and your sidewalk uh, to, to let people know that this landscape is intentional. You are mowing your grass, you just have, have less of it. But the grass you have is manicured and looks, looks really nice. And then anything beyond that mowing is, you know, those are the, the native plantings that, that you're gonna favor. So yeah, native grasses uh, are really good. You know, I've noticed this year, this is just, just a hypothesis, but we have a terrible problem with Japanese stilt grass now. The deer have spread it around. It is a monoculture all over the place. And I'm not seeing any grasshoppers. We have lost our grasshoppers because they can't eat that stuff because they have replaced our, our grasses. So get those native grasses back in there. Grasshoppers, I talk about caterpillars, but as far as fields go, grasshoppers are the most important thing in terms of transferring energy. So, and if you're, if you're with Audubon, the kestrel is suffering terribly because of the loss of grasshoppers. That's largely what they're eating along with those little rodents. Um, we did get a few questions about, how do I want to say this? Well, people enjoyed your mosquito control uh, technique. Um, and I, I think we, we've got some questions here about what folks can do for other insects that they might want to control a little bit. Termites, carpenter ants, carpenter bees were the ones that were listed. How would you suggest people deal with or address? <laughs> Termites, you know, they've gone, they've gone from very long lasting uh, drenches they used to put around your foundation, chloridine and some other things, uh, to termite baits. So first they'll come and they put wood blocks around your, your uh, foundation to see whether you have termites and where you have them. And then they put uh, uh, a termite aside in those, those wood blocks. It's very controlled. It's a much more environmentally friendly way to control termites. We do have to control termites. They do eat our houses. Um, carpenter bees, they only eat our house a little bit. You know, they're actually good pollinators. If you can find a way, give them an alternative. They love uh, untreated pine you know, have the board and put it out flat and then they'll, they'll go up underneath. But, you know, I understand people don't like those round holes, but um, you really, it's gonna take a lot of carpentries before it chops your house down. Uh, carpenter ants, carpenter ants do not eat wood. They live in, in wood that's already been compromised. So uh, wood that has been, um, has dry rot, it got wet and then then is kind of dry rotting. The ants will move in and, and uh, hollow that out. They're just throwing it out, but they're not eating it like termites. 
Um, so you can actually coexist with carpenter ants without them hurting your structure any more than it's already been hurt. Typically, carpenter ant populations are in trees in your, your backyard. And they come into your house, particularly in the springtime, because there's, there's food there. And that food is usually in the form of, of sugars and things that they, that they love. And then later in the season, they're, they're usually not there. But um, again, in terms of structural problems, they're, they're not a problem. And remember, you're feeding your, your pileated woodpecker with them. We got one more to add to that list that just came through. What about ticks? Is that okay. going to get the ticks? You really want to control ticks, control the deer. I mean, you're talking about, about deer ticks. I'm sure that's, that's the, you know, the carrier of Lyme disease, the black-legged tick. And part of their life cycle is to uh, mate on deer. Um, another part of their life cycle is, is uh, mice in the woods, but, but they're an important component of the food web. If you somehow get rid of all your mice, you've really clobbered the life on your, your property. So focus on the deer. We've got way too many of them. Um, they're over the carrying capacity. They're destroying the forest. It's not their fault. We got rid of the deer predators. So we've got to control them in, in some way. There is a product. It used to be called Daminex, but I don't think it's called that anymore, which is it's cotton balls soaked in pyrethroids that the mice take back to their nests. They make nests out of it. And then when they go back into the nest, the ticks that are on them um, die. And, and there's some evidence that that works pretty well. But everybody wants to get rid of all the vegetation on their property to get rid of ticks. Uh, ticks want high humidity. It's not the vegetation, but they will crawl up on, on plants to jump onto you. They don't jump, they grab. It's called questing. So this is another reason to have grass paths that you keep mowed. Uh, the ticks are not in your lawn. There's been good studies showing that there's like, you know, 78% fewer ticks in, in your lawn. Um, Keep it mowed, and then then during particularly May, June, and early July, that's when tick infectivity is the highest. Uh, just be be vigilant. You know, if you get a tick, and you didn't hear this from me because I'm not a medical doctor, but I heard it from a doctor. Pull the tick off and put neosporin where it was was biting, uh, and and if. Unless the tick has been there for uh, many, many hours, you will kill the Borrelia before it gets into your capillaries. And ever since we, we got that tip from a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, every time we do it religiously, it works. We don't get Lyme disease. Now I've had Lyme disease five times, so I know about it. I know, know how it works. Uh, but if I follow that simple rule and there's no downside to it all, it'll help you a lot. That is some great practical advice that I uh, wasn't expecting at this webinar. Uh, great. All right, we have a very specific question here. Are all non-native and or cultivars bad? Uh, <laughs> this person writes, I have many non-native cultivars, flowering plants that support tons of pollinators. Um, and they ask, are native ours any better than cultivars? Uh, a lot of questions in there. Um, all of, you know, Nothing is all bad or all good. There's, there's a smiley face and a grumpy face associated with, with everything. The question is, are there more smiley faces or grumpy faces? Is a plant bad? It's a relative term. Bad compared to what? Can you find a native that does a better job? In almost all cases, you can. But there are a lot of, of native plants, for example, that have cultivars where the cultivar has been shown to support just as many pollinators as the straight species. So it depends on the genetic change that was that occurred that created the cultivar. Many cultivars are natural variants that are found in nature, and they've simply been brought in, cloned, and, and put a name on it. Um, others have been selected. So if you have bloodroot that's a double flower, you have, you have taken the reproductive parts of that flower and made them into a petal. So it's very pretty, but it has zero uh, benefit for for uh, pollinators. There's no nectar and no pollen. That's true for for hydrangea arborescens. Um, Annabelle, the cultivar for the native hydrangea, get the straight species, and then you have a lot of pollinator value. So it depends. It's kind of a species specific thing. Um, most of them have not been evaluated. Although I would follow 
I would look at uh, Mount Cuba's website. They've done a lot of good work evaluating uh, cultivars of native plants for pollinators. A lot of very valuable information there uh, that, that you should know about. So it's nothing's all good or all bad. Um, one thing we did a study that showed that that uh, out of six traits that we looked at for woody plants, the only one that decreased insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. That loads that leaf with anthocyanins that are feeding deterrents. Um, so a simple rule would be avoid those red leaf cultivars and, and you'll be better off. Uh, so it's a case by case situation. Super helpful. Another uh, interesting question here. What do you think about having a volunteer yard that's self-planted by plants that have seeded themselves? Yeah, that's called addition by subtraction. The only You can get that native yard if you just keep taking the non-natives out. The problem today, though, is there's so many invasive species out there that you won't just get natives volunteering in your yard. You're going to get non-natives, too, that are highly invasive. So if you if you religiously keep the oriental bittersweet out and the autumn olive and all those other things as they come in when they're small, uh, you can build a, a, a very nice native native garden. That's an easy way to do it. You don't have to spend any money on plants. They will come in themselves. Um, I think, so we're gonna do two or three more questions here. Folks, you could still have time to post them. Um, so this would be, uh, we got a lot of questions about what I would call advocacy. How can people get their local, their state government to make some of these changes to, you know, to re require native plants or, um, you know, get the HOA to stop spraying for mosquitoes, et cetera. And I would put in a small plug. Audubon does work on this. Our chapters do a lot of work on this at the local level in North Carolina. Um, but what, I'm curious what you're seeing, you know, nationally in communities across the country is, yeah. um, uh, and you what know, you'd recommend. We're in much better shape today than we were uh, just a few years ago. Th these ideas are catching on quickly and a lot of people are on board. Uh, and of course, that news reaches the politicians. You're, the local people that you elect want to be elected again. If you make it, if you're vocal about it, make it very clear that conservation is an important issue. Um, and by the way, there's the the um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which uh, has been in the works for years now, uh, has passed in the House and it's up for a vote in the Senate. It's going to be a huge influx of money towards conservation uh, that uh, it's coming up for a vote very, very quickly. So this is a great time to contact your senator and say, please pass this. Fortunately, it does have bipartisan support, but it'll be a tremendous amount of money, the biggest in generations that will come to conservation everywhere across the country, including local, uh, Audubon's gonna get some. So, um, so uh, that's one thing you can do, but let it be known, we're not gonna vote for you again if you don't do what we want. I mean, that's what elected officials are supposed to do. So make it known that these are important issues to, to you. Um, what was the other part of the question? I did have an answer to it. <laughs> no, that, that was a great answer. I think maybe the other question would be outside of um, government. Oh, oh you said HOA, little... HOAs. That's yeah. That was, yeah. Join your HOA. These are people, these are citizens just like you that are doing what they think is best. Uh, these rules from HOAs came up largely in the 70s to keep people from putting rusty cars in their front yard. It was to to increase the the status of your your you know your little association there. Then they got into landscaping to try to make it neat and perfect. And and uh, I had no idea what that they were wrecking the the ecosystem to the degree that they were. But when they learn that, when you join them and say, hey, you know, these are really harmful practices. I'm getting emails from people who have done that to say it works. They're listening. We're changing it. Um, also, I mean, if you want to get nasty about it, in the state of Maryland, somebody somebody sued their HOA and said, you don't have the right to tell me how to landscape. And they won. So there's now a precedent, a legal precedent, weakening the power of these HOAs. So, but it's much better to change from within, join them and say, this is, this is just not the future, folks. Let's learn how to do ecological gardening in an attractive way. We can still have high status landscapes, but they're, they're not gonna be deadscapes. Great, thanks, Doug. And I would say, um, I had a few questions in the chat there. 
the federal legislation that he mentioned was the Recovering America Wildlife Act, Wildlife Act, and I believe there could be a vote as soon as this month, if yes. I'm not mistaken. It's going to happen soon. Um, yes. So folks can stay tuned for that. Um, and then the other thing I was going to mention is the state bill in North Carolina that we've been working on would require native plants to be used in landscaping on state property. Uh, it passed the Senate two years ago. It did not pass the House this year, and we'll be working really? on it again next year. So, yeah, folks, stay tuned or get in touch. You can learn more about that. Um, so we had a lot of how-to garden questions, and I think we might just need to wrap up here with one broad question. Um, I'm not missing it. Um, yeah, I guess it would be, what would, what's your go-to resource for folks who are looking to remove or get rid of invasive plants, invasive grasses? Um, I mean, who yeah. do you hire? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> there, there are companies who, who uh, do that. We don't have enough of them. You know, it's true for most of our gardening needs. People don't garden themselves. They hire somebody. They hire a lawn care service. Or, or, and what we want to do is build up what we call ecological gardeners or ecological landscapers, ecological designers, so that you can just go to the Yellow Pages and, and hire somebody. And you don't have to worry about it. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for a career, that's going to be a great one because there's not enough of those around. Everybody's looking for them. And where you go is around, the, all, you know, all those sources change as you move around the country. So I, I can't name any particular ones. And, and sorry, I think I should have clarified looking at these questions again. I think the question is also the go-to source for learning how to do, do it yourself, to, to kill sod grass or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of good books out there that will tell you how to do it. Larry Weiner has a, a book called, um, <laughs> called I Forget. Larry Weiner, look, look it up. Um, but if you, if you Google uh, controlling invasives, uh, really, this is where the Google is a great resource. A lot of things will, will, will pop up. Um, so the information is out there. It is much more common, commonly available today than it was just a few years ago. Great. Well, thanks again. I think that is about time for the Q&A. Um, and I think we'll hand it over to the Kate Fear Audubon folks. Um, Doug, did you have any final th thoughts before we hear from Kate Fear Audubon? Um, you know, my final thought is really what I, what I opened up with. Uh, the, the future of conservation is in, in your hands, everybody. So um, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but a little bit each, each year will make a huge difference. And I thank you for your efforts. Wow, Doug, what a great, great, great program. And we really want to thank you for all that you're doing for our planet and for our insects. I didn't realize that the main, main thing we could do is save every caterpillar that we have available. <laughs> there you and, go. It'll, it, and they'll take care of the rest. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I want to say, uh, KFIR Audubon has been working with the, uh, our local extension service to develop this program, Nature at Home. And what we're ab all about is getting our people to uh, be aware of the fact that they can make their yard more bird friendly, more insect friendly, more wildlife friendly by following a lot of the guidelines that you gave us tonight. And I, I've done a lot of exciting things in my life, but this is one of the most exciting because of the impact it can have on our community and on our future with our climate. So uh, your ideas are inspiring. This talk was inspiring. And I really want to raise a toast to you. Those of you who are sitting at home with your wine glass, raise a toast to Doug. <laughs> <laughs> it's only water, but... <laughs> <laughs> And also I wanna raise a toast to Charlie Winterbauer because he's the one that found you uh, 11, well, more than 11 years ago and brought you into our area and changed him into a native plant person from a bird person. And now he's had that same effect on me. So, and a lot in our community. So um, Charlie, also, we need a toast for Charlie as well. 
<laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have I'm gonna have everybody drunk before the night's out. <laughs> I want to also thank and raise a toast to Matt and Catherine and Patty Thompson who worked with me initially coming together, trying to put all our ideas together to see how we could make this work. And it's been a beautiful synthesis of ideas and work and cooperation. And it's very, very exciting. So you can toast them as well. Uh, and I want to toast Lloyd Singleton, who's head of our Arboretum and gives us great support and Ray Danner, ornithologist at the university, who's been very instrumental in giving us feedback and helping us with everything. Uh, and I want to thank my wife, Catherine, um, who's supportive of me and all my craziness and her leadership that she's given to this project in developing the program of educating and not educating, but training and working with the native, the native uh, excuse me, the master gardeners in developing this program so that they feel comfortable going out and meeting with the community, meeting with homeowners and discussing how they can make their yards more bird friendly, more caterpillar friendly, uh, more wildlife friendly. And uh, it's, it's just been a wonderful collaboration. Okay, and I think Matt's up next and he'll take over from here. Thank you all. All right, Th thank you so much, Jim. And we'll keep this brief. My name is Matt Colligan. I'm with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service in, in uh, North Carolina here in uh, the New Hanover County Center here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I was actually in the room Back in 2012 at, at UNCW at the Lumina Theater, Doug, when you when you were there presenting uh, about your bringing nature home, and and so uh, right now I'd just like to share uh, the program that we're under development here um, in uh, New Hanover County called Nature at Home, and Nature at Home is a, is a program where we are activating our master gardeners, our extension master gardeners, after they've gone through training to go out uh, into the community and evaluate uh, residents' yards, their, their porches, their rooftops, to, to look at their habitat quality and offer recommendations to uh, enhance that and improve that. And um, if let's see if I'm able to share, let's see. Um, let's, oh, I wanna stop sharing that guy. So we have our, uh, let's see here. all right, hopefully folks at home can see uh, our website up here where we're going to work on a better URL in the future, but this is off of our New Hanover County um, Cooperative Extension homepage, and we just have some information about the Nature at Home certification program. So like I said, trained master gardeners will come out and evaluate your yard. And if you uh, pass muster, we'll, we'll even give you this wonderful little sign here. And I know there's lots of programs like this around the country, and we've certainly built off of some, uh, some other models. And uh, I'd like to, to note um, uh, New Hope Audubon and Chatham and uh, Durham and um, what other county? I'm missing them. And, and then up in Virginia, we also want to thank um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, where they've actually got state statutes supporting um, uh, folks who use uh, friendly landscaping practices, including uh, incorporation of native plants. So uh, if you're anywhere near uh, us here in Wilmington, New Hanover County right now, we're, we're just focused on New Hanover County, but we'd love to partner with our, our neighbors in Brunswick and Pender County. Um, our, our focus here is definitely a coastal bent. We have a lot of resources um, from the Coastal Landscaping Initiative, a, a, an NC State um, and Sea Grant Initiative. And you can see on our website all these wonderful resources that you can use to, to look up how to enhance your yard. And, and one I want to point out is this plant toolbox. Someone was asking earlier about what ground cover should I use that's not grass? Well, here on the plant toolbox, over 5,000 plants are in this database, and it has a wonderful searchable uh, feature over here, and you can you can type in or select what type of plant you want. And so for native 
and uh, ground cover plants. I do believe this has 89 different options. And so then you can pick from there what's good in your region or what other characteristics you want. So uh, keep an eye at that. And uh, if you, um, like I said, we're here in New Hanover County, but make take advantage of the extension office wherever you're at. I saw someone joined us all the way from Manhattan, Kansas, home of K-State and where my mother was born. And uh, so go to those offices locally because they already have developed these wonderful lists of what are your best native trees? What are your most resilient ground covers that are native? So go bug them. And um, here in New Hanover County, we definitely encourage you to reach out. You can apply to, to, to participate in this program in person here at the, uh, at the Arboretum, New Hanover County Arboretum, 6206 Oleander Drive, or apply online um, using the uh, little Google form that we have embedded in our, in our website here. And uh, we also have a wonderful little brochure you can take a look at. Um, and we're, already, we're gonna have to edit that, uh, that brochure to, to really harp on the no light pollution now that we know better. So uh, we're, we're continuing to learn and this is only possible through collaboration. So thank you everybody for participating. And uh, yeah, let's see if I can even get the brochure to, uh, I've already downloaded it so I can hopefully share it. Here we go. Let's show this. Well, they can't see that yet. So let's. Uh... There we are. All right. Uh, so please, like I said, take advantage of your, your local extension resources and, and go and ask questions about native plants. And, and really our, our next step besides just educating residents is getting out to those nurseries, the politicians, the homeowners associations and the developers so we can get on the front end of this and really start promoting these native plants. So thank you everybody. And uh, I hope you have a great evening and you, and you start in your own, own yard as soon as tomorrow. So thanks for being, and I, and I was great, it was great to see, I think we got up to 602 participants at the peak of this evening's talk. So Doug, congratulations, and thank you for being here for the long haul. Well, you're welcome.